uh, Graham Hoskins, welcome to Australian Musician. Yes, thank you, Greg. Good to see you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on 40 years of your, your store, Concept Music. Uh, quite an achievement. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Greg. It's um, yeah, it snuck up on me a little bit, but it, yeah, and particularly at the moment where we got a bit distracted by things in the lead up, it sort of was, felt a bit hard to celebrate. But yeah, it is. It's um, starting to reflect a little bit now. Yeah. You started out with music uh, playing trombone. Why trombone? Uh, <laughs> after nearly 60 years of playing trombone, I still can't tell you why I love trombone, but I did a music aptitude test in primary school, um, went to the interview and they said, what do you want to play? And I just said, I said, well, I play trombone. Uh, and at that point, I'd never even seen one before, apart from maybe on the black and white minstrels uh, on TV. And uh, I just said, I want to play trombone. That's the only thing I wanted to play. And they said, what if you can't have trombone? What's your second choice? And I said, oh, trombone. So, <laughs> and so I got the only trombone position in the music class. And uh, thinking that everybody else wanted the trombone position, and I was the lucky one, finding out years down the track that no one else wanted to play trombone at all. So, <laughs> so there I was. So, um, yes, yeah, so that started when I was well, 12, moving into the high school program. Yeah. So you ended up... Uh playing trombone um, professionally? You did some gigs? Yes, and... yes. Yeah, I was very lucky, very, very lucky. Um, that When I left school, there was was hardly any trombone players around. So I, was, I had teachers, I was still studying and playing, and then teachers that would say, well, look, I, I can't do this gig, but I've got a student who can sit in. So I was getting work professionally almost as soon as I left school, which was extremely lucky. Yeah, well, what sort of gigs were you playing? Uh, any any one of yeah. you played with? Oh oh yeah, a few. Um, mostly touring acts. You know, a lot of session work where they just need a band for the day, or a touring act would come through and could be a um, they'd need a band for the you know to rehearse for as they did. So, but there's been some yeah some lovely times. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. A couple of years when he was out for the telephone shows, they were they not only had the telephone, they had the gigs. So that was fun. Um, the, the, the biggest one I've did that I talk about sometimes in my um, history of the shop is was the BGs, uh, the Wacker ground here, the Cricket Association. That was a big outdoor gig, and uh, that was that was a big big show, and um, it was a, a lot of fun. There was only one trombone, two trumpets, fairly small horn section. Uh, of course, didn't get to rehearse with them. They just zoom up in their limo, they jump on stage and leave, and so the one rehearsal with the MD in the afternoon and the gig at night. But it was a amazing show it was fantastic yeah. uh, you began your uh, career in retail at Theo's music yes I did what did you learn from those days oh I learned a lot I learned what it's like to be thrown in the deep end in the very very deep end <laughs> I was only 17 I just left school I was in there buying a mute from a trombone some people would say more people should buy mutes for their trombones um, but I was I was in there and he said, what are you doing this year? And I said, oh, nothing, you know. And he said, oh, do you want a job? I went, oh, okay. Um, he said, okay, you can start tomorrow. Come in tomorrow at nine o'clock. And I went home and told my dad, I've got a job. He goes, what, what doing? I said, oh, in the music shop. He goes, oh, how much are you getting paid? I said, I don't know. He said to come in tomorrow. Um, so I turned up the next day and was told to clean out the case room. And, and there I went. But I think on my very first day, uh, it was a small shop in those days. It was only Theo and myself right then. Um, so I cleaned out the case room and then I came out and then Theo went for lunch. So I was standing in the middle of this shop not knowing what a guitar was or how to tune one or knowing much about anything except trombone. Um, and stood there looking around going, what, what do I do now? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I learned to swim pretty fast. It was, um, you know, there was no internet to find things. There was a few paper catalogues and, you know, you, you wanted to find something out. It was actually quite hard, but, you know, but you survived and um, soon learnt what a guitar was and, you know, what a guitar string was and, you know, and took off from there. But it was, yeah, it's a fairly steep learning curve. Yeah. So what made you want to buy your own store? Um, I don't think I really, I wasn't, a desire or plan at the time, but I was always into, I loved reading books about advertising, about marketing. I loved books about copywriting and about sales and um, visual merchandising. And, um, you know, I, I guess I felt like I eventually wanted to 
test myself or stretch my wings. I didn't feel that there was a future for me at Theo's with the, you know, with his kids coming through, which was perfectly appropriate. Um, but I just felt like, well, there's probably not a long-term future for me here. What am I going to do? And of course, all I knew at that stage, I've been, work, I was 25. I've been working there for eight years, and that's all I knew was working in a shop. So, feeling like I, there wasn't a long-term future for me, rightly or wrongly. Um, I just decided that I think I'll have my own shop. So as you do, uh, na naively as a 25 year old, I found a premises and, and um, paid the first month's rent and off I went. Yeah. Uh, with the early 80s, um, often stock- It was 1980. 1980, yeah. Yeah, yeah July 1980. Yeah, so um, often the stock in a music store is determined by the, the kind of music that is happening uh, at at the time, mm. uh, synth pop mm. was uh, ab about to hit or was hitting. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. I imagine uh, the store was full of DX sevens and uh, Jupiter eights. Um, I re I remember when they were released. Yes, it's funny looking back now because a lot of those iconic collectible instruments I can remember when they came out and um, looking at them, going, "Oh, gee, I don't know if there's a market for these." You know, and, oh, that's a, that's all. Oh, I wonder if this will sell. Um, but when I, when I started, I primarily thought I was going to be opening an orchestral store. So I had a lot of brass instruments, a lot of sheet music, a lot of band arrangements and all sorts of school instruments because that was felt was my forte. It didn't, um, but guitars and amplifiers as well. And I think the first thing I sold on the first day was a, a chromatic tuner for a guitar. And it was like, oh, OK, I didn't expect that to be my first sale. Um, and off it went in guitar direction. So progressed over the years to carry more and more rock and roll pop instruments and less and not less and less brass and woodwind, but the, the, the guitar side of the business just grew in a phenomenal way that I didn't expect. And uh, the brass and woodwind was still very important to me. I'm still passionate about school music, but uh, yeah, it took off in a very different direction to what I expected. Yeah. Uh, how important do you think it is being a musician to running a music store? Oh, good question. Because um, these days I try to always employ musicians um, because I feel that if we're going to help people on their journey, it's important that they can relate to them. So I always employ musicians because um, I feel that they will be able to help people on their journey. Uh, is it important? I think it's, you've got to love music. You've got to be an instrumentalist of some kind. I don't think it's important to be a musician. Um, but like a lot of jobs, I suppose, it's, you know, people come in often and say, geez, it must be great working here, surrounded by guitars. You, you can play guitar all day. And, uh, but well, you know, yeah, you, you, not really what it's like working in a shop. You do get to play some beautiful instruments, but it's not just sitting around playing. So you, I think there's a balance there for someone who's an enthusiast. You can work in a shop and when you're doing it all day, you don't feel like it at night. So there's a balance of, for the young guys who are enthusiastic, you know, you don't want to kill their enthusiasm for playing their instrument either. So hence, I tend to have quite a few who are casual and part-time because full-time would kill their aspirations to an extent. So I think you do, you definitely got to be a musician, even in an amateur sense, you wouldn't have to be a professional, but um, it's, I, you know, it was the only reason I got offered a job. It wasn't a plan to work in a music shop. He just offered me a job. So I said, yes. Um, and, but I wouldn't have got offered the job if I wasn't playing trombone. Yeah. Uh, you were at your first store for 10 years. Um, yes. How much of a gamble was it to move to a new premises, a bigger premises? Yeah, retrospectively, it wasn't a big gamble at all. But at the time, there was a lot of angst over, even though it's a few kilometres away, uh, that was closer to the city centre. Now I'm about five k's out of the city centre. Um, so I had a lot of angst over, are people going to follow me? Will I lose half my customers? Uh, but the reality of the necessity of the move was that the parking was getting worse and worse and worse. And for musicians, for our kind of customer, they want to drop in for five minutes, supposedly, and leave 40 minutes later because they've got lost in the environment, um, which is terrific. And when they couldn't park, they, they, I kept getting complaints of driving round and round the block and I couldn't park, so I left. So. I was, I had to move. I didn't want to move uh, away from the location, but um, then I found this premises, which had good street frontage, excellent parking. And um, so nervously it was like, oh, well, I just, I've just, I've got to move. So let's just see. Uh, but, but 
you know, in hindsight, it was a fantastic move. I probably should have done it earlier because the parking and the access was just, was, became gold, really. Yeah. Um, customer relationships are a big part of retail. Um, yeah. over, over the years, who, who are some of the uh, long-time uh, Western Australian artists that have uh, called concept music home? Oh, loads and loads. It's, that's another fun thing, I guess. Not that I like getting older, but it's an inevitability. But I look back now and I've got customers who were kids at the time that are now adults and parents with their own kids and they're bringing their kids into the shop. So there's a load of local young bands that, have, um, that I've, I guess, grown up with. And that gets down to people like Jebediah and Eskimo Joe and uh, Diesel even. You know, I knew Diesel and Sir Diesel when he was still in school, um, when he was still just Mark you know, um, and the guys from Jebediah, I remember judging the Jebediah band in a campus band competition and getting one of the young guys doing work experience. So quite a few of these young guys I've had here in work experience. And now, of course, they're grown up and they're still in the industry and they, they bring their kids into buy instruments. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's something lovely to reflect on when someone brings in their son and said, oh, I bought my first guitar off Graham in 1980 and, or 1982 and, and we start telling stories and it's, yeah, it's quite weird in a lovely way. Yeah. Um, what about, do you have some favorite customer stories over the years? Things that stand out? Oh, good and bad. Yeah. Good and bad. <laughs> Chased a few guys down the street and, you know, had to deal with a few awkward situations, but uh, there's been some, uh, even just a couple of things happen all the time. There's lovely moments all the time Had a lovely moment. Uh, just recently where a mum and a dad come in with their daughter who was they're getting a guitar for, a, for her 18th birthday and they came in to buy a, a guitar pack, a little Yamaha guitar pack for $199. And I got talking to them. I said, well, she plays cello, so she's already a musician. And they left about 40 minutes later with a, uh, an $800 guitar and some accessories. And they were so, so excited. And it was such an appropriate thing for them to buy for their daughter. And they told me after, oh, we're so glad we came in. We're so excited. We were going to buy it online and get it delivered. And we thought we might as well pick it up ourselves. And if they'd bought it online, they would have bought that 199 pack. And it would have been an appropriate instrument for someone to start on. But in here in the environment and talking to them, um, you know, that, so that, 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 that I felt really proud of the experience for them that they were so excited. So those moments happen weekly and I love them. That's the bit I love most about retail. Um, in the bigger picture, I was at an AMA executive meeting once when I, uh, last year, the year before, I got a text from one of the boys. Um, how's the day? Yep, just sold a guitar to some guy called Joe from the Eagles. <laughs> and I'm racking my brain thinking of the West Coast Eagles football team going, well, there's a Brad, there's a Nick, there's a, I can't think of any Joe in the Eagles, you know. And so I wrote, Joe. And they came back and said, Joe Walsh. I went, oh my God, Joe Walsh. And I'm in Melbourne and I'm a meeting and I missed out. Um, but as the meetings go, I was back that night and then blow me down, Joe came back again the next day. And then he came back three times uh, and bought instruments off us. And that, that was a proud moment in the sense that it was exciting that he came in once and wow, we had Joe Walsh in the store, you know, and he was introduced to us by his minder who came in first and said, Joe Walsh has come in this store leave him alone, don't hassle him, don't ask him any questions. He'll, he'll ask you if he wants to know something. So everyone had to stand back and not take photos and not talk to him for about 20 minutes. And then he started to ask us questions and ask what does this effects pedal do? And have you got any glass slides? And, um, and then he came back the next day and hung out and bought a couple of guitars. And then he came back again two days later. So, so that made me feel proud, proud of my boys because I wasn't even there. Um, but proud of the environment that for someone who tours the world and goes, has got so many guitars and for him to come back in the first time was really lovely to come back twice was, Oh, wow, this is awesome. And then to come back a third time and be quite relaxed almost as a normal customer. Um, I think all the team got a buzz out of it. Of course, someone like Joe Walsh, um, but to come back, I, I just felt proud of the boys and proud of the shop and that there was something that interesting for him to come back and look at. Yeah, for sure. Um, how has music retail changed over 40 years, do you think? Oh, gee. Um, I mean, unrecognisable in so many ways. I mean, a lot of it, I think, hasn't changed at all. A lot of it is 
if your store is presented well, you've got good stock that's well maintained, you're interacting with people exactly the same when somebody walks through the door. Um, but totally different now for, you know, back in 1980, if you wanted to go look at some guitars and you wanted to see what the choice was, you had to get in your car and drive to the next shop and you got in the car and drive to the next shop. Um, you couldn't value anything. You couldn't, there was no way, I'll just go on the internet and check out what this is worth. There was um, a lot of stuff, you know, didn't have mobile phones, didn't have fax machines, didn't, you know, it was, uh, it was just so different. My day is so different to what it was in those first 10 years when there was no internet, where there was no computers, where there was no email. You'd open the shop in the morning and turn on the lights. And okay, I might ring up a few schools. Um, um, what do I do now? But you sort of opened the shop and waited for something to happen. Now you open the shop, you turn on your computers, you download your emails and you run your auto reorder list and you get, you know, or it's, it's so, such a managing a store is, and running a store is a totally different experience. Uh, but the fundamentals of customer relations are the same. But your chance, I have a, a saying I say to the boys, you've got one chance to make a first impression with every new customer. So let's use that chance to the greatest effect. And in the old days, that was how you answered the phone or when they walked in your store. These days, of course, they've got access to every store in the world. They've, they've been online. They've looked at everything you've got before they even enter your store. So that window to your store has become very, very, very different. Um, and I, I struggle with it in the sense that I don't enjoy that tech side of it so much. I enjoy the face-to-face. -face. I'd much rather have a customer sitting in my store talking to them about instruments and showing them than have them send an email. Yes, I've got one. Click. Yeah, we'll get it delivered for you. I don't think it's a, as good a consumer experience, but I understand it's a fact of life. Um, uh, so there's aspects which are very exciting uh, about the, the current age that you've got access to so much information that you, computers can just order your gear for you. Um, you can track a customers and you don't have to write Gee, the early days, would you order some sheet music from Hal Leonard or whoever it was at the time? You had to get out an order pad, um, piece of paper and a carbon paper, handwrite the order, put it in a put it in an envelope, and send it to Melbourne. Um, it was Alan's music, and then two weeks later, you get a letter back again saying, "Sorry, your order is out of stock," and then you'd have to ring your customer. And so the the difference of of how the world ran and how you ordered your stock. It had to be in writing, so you had to handwrite your orders. That was really before, you know, typewriters where we could type an order. You still had to post it to the Eastern States. And eventually, several, three or four weeks later, you'd find out whether that product was in stock or not because they would post you the answer back again. These days, not only are our expectations high and our wholesalers' expectations high, but People expect instant. They send an email and two minutes later they're on the phone going, oh, I've sent you an email. I haven't got an answer yet. Uh, um, and you go, whoa. Um, so customers' expectations have changed. The way you run the business has changed. For, be for better and for worse. The control you can have now is amazing. Um, but the transparency of the market is, is extremely challenging now. Um, it used to be a discussion where every product in your shop was marked at the, cut at the manufacturer's recommended retail price. Customer would come in and look at it. You'd have a talk and they'd say, well, I'm interested, but what can you do for me? And you go, oh, you're a member of the Musicians Union. You'll get 10% discount. Um, so these days, of course, if your price isn't very good or, or, or good already, you won't even start that conversation. So it's um, very, very different in that regard too. Yeah. Uh, in January this year, uh, we're all at the NAM show. It was business as yes. usual. Uh, less than two months later, uh, the world had changed. Um, yeah. What were your initial thoughts? Um, I was a bit, a little bit bemused at first, I suppose, because it would already talk about this virus in China at NAM, and there were already people. I remember leaving the airport in March. Some people in masks, and um, so it was really on the verge of breaking out. But I got approached by the ABC in uh, in February. ABC TV News saying, would I like to comment on the impact of COVID on your business? And I had to struggle to think of an impact. I'm like, oh, well, I have got a customer waiting for a replacement neck for a guitar from China. And he jumped on that. That's the sort of story we want, Graham. Um, I went, okay. And it was really the only story I could come up with at the time. Um, but then, of course, it started to get worse and it started to get worse. And all of a sudden, it just exploded and it was 
are we going to have to close the shop? Um, you know, what's going to happen? Is, and I was, I was, I had all these 40th anniversary things planned. We we're going to have a gig. We we're going to have some VIP nights and, and all of a sudden we might have to close the shop and we're having discussions with the staff over, well, you know, what if this is the end of the business? And at that time it was like, well, geez, I may not make it to 40. You know, it was a genuine fear. Um, uh, and Western Australia, gee, we've been lucky if that's the right word, um, because it didn't get very bad. We complied a hundred percent with all the government directives, um, with the sanitizing, with everything, but it just never got bad in Western Australia. Um, but gee, the impact I couldn't have imagined. So when the ABC news came back again, two months later saying, can we do a follow up interview? It was a totally different story, you know, showing them what we can't get, showing them the, the lack of supply. And, um, and of course, feeling extremely concerned for shops, for people, for other countries. It's, um, um, I mean, on the, on the fortunate side for the music industry, it's actually globally, I gather, there's been an, it, drastic uptake in people taking up instruments uh, and in that regard it's been a privilege because in the early stages people were coming in extremely scared what if I get locked home what if I can't go out I need something to do I, I, I'll take a piano um, I'll take a guitar um, I'll get some drums they, they were very nervous almost panic buying uh, that settled down but demand has remained strong but there was a genuine sense that we were actually helping people get through this uh, and there's not many people in many industries not many industries that could say that that we're actually making a difference to helping people get through this situation so that felt I, I think that it felt like you were making a genuine difference in this in society that you were helping people so that was nice but but gee what an impact it's um uh, yeah it, it's uh, I was speechless to describe the impact it's had on so many people and when I speak to people in Melbourne and they say, what, you're not wearing a mask, um, what, the shop's open, um, uh, you know, it's, yeah, we've been so lucky in Western Australia in particular. Yeah. Uh, you have found ways to celebrate your 40th anniversary. Uh, you gave yes. 40 guitars uh, in conjunction with 96 FM. Yes. Uh, tell yeah. me about that day, that experience. Yeah, that was great. That, that provided the opportunity to celebrate. Um, we'd been doing some promotions with 96 FM and it became, we both became aware that it was both our 40th anniversaries. And so in discussions with their managing director over here, cause 96 FM, they started with FM radio the year that I opened the shop and I, that fact had escaped me. So that was the start of stereo radio. I remember going, wow, how, how did they get stereo in a car radio? This is incredible. Um, so there was a lot to reflect on there. And we're talking to his, the MD from 96. And he says, what about we give away, he's not a guitar player, but he loves guitar. So this, and he goes, what about if we gave away 40 Fender guitars in 40 days, you know? And I just went, whoa, hang on, whoa, you know, settle down. Um, but we got talking about it. I said, well, if it was a Fender Squire, maybe, you know, something's, we're not going to give away 40 custom shop guitars worth $5,000 each, but maybe we can swing something with, you know, with some Squire guitars. So next challenge, of course, these times was even getting access to that much stock. Um, and Fender and Mark, bless his heart, was, you know, considering the options of how to tell others, you know, how do I tell people that, yes, we've let Graham buy 40 guitars um, when other people can't get stock, but with their assistance and with 96 FM's assistance, we put together a package and, and over 40 days, they ran a competition on radio where every day 40 people would dial in. So they really milked the 40 aspect. The following morning, they would call one of those people and for 40 days, each, each day one person would win a, a Squire guitar. And on the 40th day, they had a big breakfast and a big giveaway and actually drew one of the guitar winners to win $40,000 cash plus a $40,000 VWT rock car. So, uh, but it was a quite an exciting morning uh, to have all the 40 guitars lined up in the foyer of the Panfield uh, over here. We were lucky that we could do that because initially they weren't sure how they're going to give them away because could we allow 40 people to come together at the same spot? Um, but fortunately we could. Uh, and they drew all the guitars by lot and 40 people walked away with a Squire guitar. And there's some exciting stories even in that morning of people who say, I used to play guitar, but, you know, and my grandson wants to play guitar. So there was quite, 
I'm sure some of them ended up on Gumtree, uh, but there was a lot of people who came in to buy the accessories and came in to buy an amplifier and were excited about learning guitar. And I thought, again, this, this could be a, a moment in time where some people start their musical journey, that this is the start of something really important in their life. And so that was, yeah, that was exciting. It was a terrific, terrific 40 days and a terrific combination. And I thank 96FM and, and Fender for, for helping get it all organised. What do you know now about music retail that you didn't know on day one? <laughs> um, gee, what I didn't know on day one, I didn't, retrospectively, I'm very surprised I survived with, I had eight years experience and that turned out to be just enough to get me through. Um, so in those days, I didn't know what a stock term was. I didn't know what a GP was. You know, I didn't, I didn't understand probably properly what a margin was. So, um, but years and years of experience later uh, and you know so i love to read books on marketing on advertising on copywriting and consumer behavior on psychology so at the psychology side of it con consumer psychology fascinates me so i know a lot more uh, i feel like there's still a lot to know um and it's yeah gee uh reflecting back on it i you know i'm a little bit surprised that it that I lasted four years, let alone 40 years. Um, it was, yeah, because of the, no, I have the, as I probably had the balance of naivety and experience that I thought I could do it with a bit less experience. I've seen people come and go in the past with almost no experience or teach a bit of guitar and think they'll open a shop and sadly don't last long. So uh, I've tried to help a number of people over the years who've wanted to open their own shop. I've tried to talk a few people out of it. And sadly, sometimes I haven't been able to talk them out of it. Um, and not out of a competition sense of saying, do you know, do you understand this? Do you understand what a margin is? Do you understand what a stock turn is? And I'll explain it to you because you need to know that. So, you know, need to know how much stock you need to put into your shop to turn over that much money to make enough profit to pay your bills. And often people have got no idea. Um, and I had very little idea, but I did have a lot of contacts. I knew a lot of people. I was in the industry already, so I could hit the ground running, so to speak. Um, so I know so much more, but I also know less. Um, I know that still the fundamentals for me are exactly the same. It's been genuinely trying to help people choose an instrument is my view. And every new staff I start, your job is pretty simple. It's to help people get the best instrument they can and to help them choose and to guide them through the choices because it's overwhelming for people when they walk in surrounded by guitars and they don't know where to start. Um, so. We say we don't, we're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're trying to help people get the most appropriate instrument for them in the best part of their musical journey and to try to become their person that will be, you know, guide them through their career, uh, musical career, whether it's professional or just, uh, not just amateur, because enthusiastic amateurs are the, you know, they're the, the lifeline of the uh, music industry. Professionals are very important, but the, uh, it's the enthusiastic amateur who all they dream about is their income is buying new guitars or getting new instruments and getting new gear. So they're the lifeblood. What does the future hold for concept music and, and music retail in general, do you think? Oh, gee, for concept music, I don't know, Greg. I, I guess I won't be here in another 40 years. So I have to start thinking now about that. Um, I've turned 65 a couple of months ago. So um, I am starting to think about what is the future of concept music. Of course, I would love it to continue. One of my staff asked me the other night, you know, what would you like to happen to, to concept music in the future? And I said, well, I guess I'd like a 30 year younger version of myself to come along and go, I'll take it on and, uh, and grow it even further and make it more specialized and more interesting. And, you know, um, future of retail in general, I think I absolutely think there's a future for good quality music stores. I think there's an invaluable experience for customers to come into this environment it's for kids to walk in and see it all and be able to touch it all and feel it all is, um, you know, as annoying as it can be to have kids coming in the shop and touching and feeling everything. I say to my boys, it's, it's great that if this is somebody's a natural experience when they go to a music store, this is awesome because it's a real, it's a real experience. It's a real environment. So online is obviously going to continue to be bigger and stronger. Um, it's, yeah, but I think there's always going to be a place for the, a real bricks and mortar music store, as we call it. Uh, the, but you do have to provide, 
it's not just hang up some guitars and open the door and wait for people to walk in. It has to be interactive. It has to be interesting. It's got to be try to make the environment of the music store something that people leave going, wow. You know, when I've worked with designers for my stores, I've said, I want to create an environment where somebody rushes in to buy a pick or a set of strings and they end up staying for half an hour and go, oh, that was great and become a little break in their day that's not sitting in front of a screen, that's not work, that's not driving somewhere. They've actually lost themselves for half an hour in the shop. And yeah, sometimes I'll leave with a guitar or a new amplifier or a new trombone, you never know. But mostly if we can provide an environment where they come in and leave half an hour later going, oh, that was great. I think I've achieved what I want to achieve. Yeah. Well, congratulations on 40 years of concept music and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Greg. It's been lovely to talk and reflect. Mm.